Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG Public Media, TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mesilla Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Thank you for joining us for Newsmakers. I'm Casey Counts. For decades, Borderland residents considered our guest part of the family. She was in your living room in the evening, in your bedroom at night, wherever you had a TV. And now she's written her autobiography called A Place to Anchor. We're honored to spend the next half hour with Estela Casas. Welcome to KRWG and thank you for joining us, Estela. Casey, good to see you again, and thank you very much for inviting me to, to share my story, and it's great to see you. Well, what a way to start 2023 with a brand new book. I'd like to start by asking, you know, when it was that you decided that you really had to get in there and write your story? Well, Casey, um, I was diagnosed with bilateral breast cancer in, uh, it was the 31st of August in 2017. And um, I had already had, I had already gone through a cancer journey with thyroid cancer in 2010, but that was very different. So I, I just started writing. I just started putting my emotions on paper and my thoughts on paper uh, when, when I was diagnosed. And uh, it didn't really occur to me to write a book until later on. And uh, so I, I wrote, I wrote a whole bunch of chapters. And then I went back and then I read him and I said, Whoa, what were you thinking? What are you trying to say here? And I rewrote it. And uh, little by little, it just kind of started transforming into a something that could become a book. And then somebody asked me, well, why don't you share your story? Because I shared a lot of I shared a lot about the journey on TV, doing special reports on on the Portacath, on on the uh, filling the expanders, on even just sharing my story. And every time I wrote something down, um, it was cathartic for me. But I thought, you know what, if I share this story, it could be cathartic for somebody else and help them get through their journey. So it didn't I didn't start off saying I'm going to write a book. I just started writing for myself. And how did it expand into into other areas of your life beyond cancer? Ah, oh, gosh, um, I've, I've read this several times. So here's a book. I have a I have a copy. It doesn't come out until February seventh officially. Uh, people have started pre ordering, but I have some books uh, that I can sell myself. Um, I I don't know. It has it has helped transform me as well, Casey. Because um, the the other night, I, you know, I, I was in bed and I was reading it, and um, you don't realize I don't I didn't realize how strong I had to be and how strong I was and it you know it made me cry a little bit to realize wow you know it was something um, it was something very painful in my life and and in the lives of those around me it's one thing to share that kind of news with your family and your closest friends it's another thing to make the decision to share it with your viewers. Did you think on that for a long time or was it just something that you knew you would you would want to do? I knew I had to do it. Uh, when I got uh, when I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer in 2010, um, I had a blog and uh, people would share their stories uh, on 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 uh, on the computer. So I thought, you know, if I open up about this, I pretty much have opened up about a lot of things in my life. I had I had a baby uh, in 2003 um, after five years after tubal ligation. Uh, so that made me a high risk mom. And I shared those stories because I had the platform. I had a platform and I wanted to use it to inform people and educate, especially women who who are afraid to get their first mammogram, who are afraid that they're, they're going to have a baby at 41, who are afraid about getting a diagnosis about thyroid cancer and a diagnosis of bilateral breast cancer. So I thought, you know, I have a platform and uh, maybe somebody will listen to me and, and somebody will, will be able to um, not necessarily not necessarily save their lives, but maybe uh, if they catch something early on, they can have a better quality of life. What kind of team did you assemble to edit and publish your book? Well, um, I started writing and then I started rewriting and then I rewrote everything again. And I reached out to actually uh, somebody who works at, at NMSU, uh, an old friend of mine, Minerva Bauman, and she, she went through that, she looked through it. 
and uh, and then I rewrote it again. And then I reached out to a friend of mine. She used to be a producer at KBIE, an executive producer at KBIE, uh, Fran Tucker. And I reached out to her, and it, this was during COVID. And I said, Fran, I, I'd like to write a book. Can you help me? Can you help me make it sing? Because she, she's a very good writer, and she has a, a real insight about storytelling. And, you know, I, I, I don't consider myself a uh, investigative reporter or anything like that. I'm a storyteller. I like to tell stories. So I started, she said, yes, I'll be glad to help you. And I started so, sending her scripts, you know, script after script, not that script, chapter after chapter after chapter. And uh, we just built this special bond. And uh, we finished up. And then I went with Mascot Publishing. So Ma Mascot Publishing, Mascot Books is a hybrid publisher. I thought, you know, if, if I if I can just put it all on paper and and, and, and publish something like this, I, it, I didn't write a book to make a living because you really don't make a living. Um, it was it's to make a life and make a difference. And so I um, it, there was maybe maybe four people involved. Really, I just handed everything over to Mascot Books, and they you know checked for misspellings or how you know, maybe flow. Uh, but I think it was probably an easy project for them because you know I already had had, had uh, have some some sort of help. And um, what was it like by the time you got to your first book signing? Well, uh, <laughs> I've had uh, I really haven't had an official book signing. Uh, we had a women's conference at Viva Chevrolet, and it was. Uh, uh, a, a news a conference for for women and turned out to, to it turned into a conference for, for men and women and i signed books there but it wasn't an official book signing and you know i did it my way um i'd like to have an official book signing where i can read a chapter or you know bits and pieces of the book so they can kind of have an idea of what it's about um it was it was really it was really great because I had some women come up to me and, and thank me and say, you know, I've, I've followed you and I'm going through the same thing. And uh, so it's it's been, it fills my heart. You know, sometimes you think, gosh, am I living, am I working with purpose? And when I get to share this story and, and talk about my book and talk about my journey with other women, I feel like I'm working and living with purpose. Let's talk about the purpose that you that you brought to so many living rooms in the borderland over the uh, nearly 30 years, uh, almost, I think, that you were uh, in broadcast almost journalism. Almost 40. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I didn't mean to Long short time. you. Uh, but I'd like to for you to talk about uh, that career, how you got into broadcast journalism in the first place. Well, I kind of fell into it, Casey. I, uh, I wanted to be a singer when I was growing up. I, I, I sang. I got a four-year voice performance scholarship to Arizona State University when I graduated from Burgess High School, and I went away. And then I realized that I didn't want to sing classical music. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't think I wanted to be a, uh, um, an opera singer. And, and uh, I just, you know, it was just not in my heart. And I gave up a four-year scholarship to pursue my dream of singing. I went off to Mexico City, and my mom and I went to Mexico City, and I was offered a five-year singing contract. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't take it because I, I'd have to live in uh, in Mexico City, and I just didn't think I was cut out for it. Um, so I used my voice in a different way, probably in a more productive way, and um, came home, uh, started going to school. It only took me 25 years to earn my degree from UTEP, you know. Um, and so I started I started going back to school, and, and things just started happening. I, I started, uh, I got a job at Channel 9. I started at Channel 9 after a three-hour interview with the news director, Mike Malter, and then I moved over to Channel 26 in Espanol, Spanish language station. I was one of the founding journalists at Channel 26 in 1984. And after a year there, went, I went back to English language TV at Channel 4, where I was there for eight years. And then 27 years, a whole lifetime at KVIA TV. So, um, you know, I've, I've been through a lot and in the middle, you know, I've had a lot of a lot of challenges and I share I've shared my life and I've opened up my heart to a lot of things as well. And uh, it's just been it's just been quite a journey. I feel very, very blessed to be able to have that opportunity to, to um, share my life with, you know, sometimes strangers. And if I can help make a difference um, in, in somebody's life, you know, it makes it all worthwhile.
Yeah, I, I do believe I was thinking about just your stint at, at uh, KBIA when I mentioned that almost uh, almost 30 years. And in that time, how did how did the job change, especially for a, a woman broadcaster? Well, you know what? I don't remember seeing anybody, any Hispanics or women who look like me on TV, you know. And uh, so I've seen a lot of changes. I see a lot more diversity. I see a lot more women on TV. So it, it's it's changed in that manner. But, you know, in a way, it's still a man's world. It, it really is. We have very few uh, news directors and general managers who are women, although that, that's not the case here in El Paso. Uh, uh, Brenda de Andaswan was a news director at, at Channel 7 on KVA, and now she's a general manager. And uh, there's a general manager at uh, Univision as well, KINT, uh, Diana de Lara Zamudio. And I think uh, Lorena Castañeda from Telemundo uh, just retired. So, uh, it, it, you know, it, it has changed. But um, I remember, Casey, when I first started at Channel 4, I was not allowed to read the top story. You know, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then everything changed and then I would read the top story, you know, all the time. So um, I have seen a lot of changes and, and, you know, the world is changing for, for women and it's changing for uh, Hispanic women as well. And, uh, and as far as technology, whew! It has changed so much. We, we used to have those three quarter inch tapes and then it went to half inch and then it went to, you know, these tiny little SD cards. So um, I, I've seen a lot of changes and the way people report the news. I, You know, Casey, I really don't like to watch or to have an opinion from, from a journalist. It's like you're supposed to stay, you know, you're not supposed to share your views, your political views or your, or your religious views on TV. You have to stay neutral. I, I feel that 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 landscape has really changed for for modern day journalists. Let's talk about some of the stories uh, that you covered along the way. Some of the ones that really stand out in your mind. Um, I found some uh, photos of you taking part in the memorial service uh, that happened the day after the mass shooting at the El Paso Walmart uh, in August of 2019. And in fact, uh, you kneeling with a little girl uh, who's mm -hmm. eight years old uh, who came to leave a message for the victims of that shooting. Tell us about the emotion in covering something so tragic as that. Um, well, I, I also, well, from far away, I covered the explosion of, of uh, the space shuttle. And uh, a lot of those things, a lot of those tragedies and a lot of those personal stories uh, of, 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 of you know, tragedy and loss change you. Uh, I realized that they changed me. And I think one of the biggest ones, biggest stories that changed me was that mass shooting. Um, I remember I was at a cattle drive <laughs> out uh, near Bowman, the Bowen Ranch, Bowman Ranch. And uh, I was on a cattle drive and I started getting phone calls and I said, I better go into the into Channel 7 to see what's happening. And, and then we started hearing all these stories and all the, you know, it was always somewhere else besides El Paso that we heard about all those ugly things, right? And then all of a sudden, we're in the thick of things. And, um, you know, just a stranger came into my community and killed my people. And um, and that changed me. Um, in a way, it softened me. And in other ways, it hardened me. You know, when you realize that there's a lot of bad people there. And um, and it softened me because it, it made me more um, compassionate and sympathetic to, to families who lost loved ones. And um, so I, I, I talk about change in my book because all those years of covering news, you know, I, I would read the stories, as, as you know, Casey, and you worked, at, you worked at Channel 7 as well, that you, that a lot of those things that we didn't share with, with the public, with our viewers, but we still read those things. And it, 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 I think you can sometimes develop a form of PTSD because you read all those things and you, and you comprehend all those things and you realize these are people in our community doing these bad things to children, to women, to uh, old people, to dogs. And, and it really does change you and uh, it changed me. Something that made me that, that, that stuck with me after that was how I think we thought of El Paso initially as maybe having this little bubble around it. And, right. and the fact that it was someone who came from 900 miles away uh, mm -hmm. to enact that kind of violence and uh, the way people came together, obviously, at, at any time that uh, something like that happens, you see the community uh, really come together. And, and you're such an important part of that. I imagine a lot of people really reached out to you in those moments. 
They did. And, you know, we were on, on, on air eight, 11 hours straight, you know, just trying to get the facts, just trying to get the, the information, the correct information. It's all, it was always good to be first, but it's most importantly to be right with the right information. So we held off a lot of information that we were getting from, from all over the place until it was official. And, you know, we did share a lot of those stories that everybody was, everybody was getting on their phones and everybody was, you know, just talking. And but so we held on and maintained composure and maintained a, a sense of calm um, that everything was going to be OK, even even beyond this tragedy. So um, it, it's always been a challenge. Um, it, it was always a challenge for me because uh, um, I'm, I'm an emotional person and uh, I wear my heart on my sleeves. And so everybody uh, knew when I was upset at something, and because everybody was upset at that as well. So um, I think we shared that com that commonality, that that in, that share sharing of emotions, especially in a tragedy of, of that magnitude. Yeah, indeed. How did you come to the decision that it was time to step away from the anchor desk? Well. Um, after it, it was probably shortly after that tragedy that I that I realized, you know, it's like I got a little antsy. It's like, what am I doing? You know, what am I doing with my life? Am I am I living and working with purpose? And the opportunity uh, came up to to move to UMC. I, I started the Santa de Stella Fund, and then uh, now I have the Santa de Stella Casas Cancer Foundation. So I thought, you know what, um, living with purpose and trying to help others is is something that I that I like. You know, it fills my heart. And I thought that this was just the right opportunity to move into something this big. So I was the executive director of the UMC Foundation, El Paso Children's Hospital Foundation, Children's Miracle Network, and um, and a and a, a border. Now I can't remember the name, and a uh, a, a, a program to help kids. Uh, or or the orthopedic surgeons would go to Juarez and help the kids there, so it was a big big job, and um, it was just it was just not a good fit for me. But I'm very glad I had the opportunity to to see that, and uh, and to see how how the lack of health care is is really um, an important part of our community that we need to be aware of and we should be advocating for because everybody deserves health care, right? Everybody deserves to be to be healthy. And then, so now I'm the creative brand strategist here at the Viva Auto Group, and I get to write commercials in English and Spanish and do some of them myself and uh, buy time on TV. And so I have, I really have the best of both worlds, but I had to, it was time to step down because, uh, I don't know, just something in my heart told me that it was time to, to move on. Do you miss do it? Do I have any regrets? Yeah. Do I have any regrets? Uh, no. Uh, I think I think 14 months that I was at UMC uh, was a was a learning process, and I learned a lot of things about people, and I learned a lot of things about myself, uh, which prepared me to be where I am now. So um, I just feel very blessed. And and what do you feel the Stand with Estella Foundation can say that it has accomplished at this point for people in the borderlands? Well, it's it's pretty new. So we went from the stand with the Stella Fund at the El Paso Community Foundation, and we gave a you know bunch of money away there. And now we formed the Stand with the Stella Casas Cancer Foundation, so I could uh, uh, help with men and children. And we haven't had that opportunity yet because I don't have enough money in that fund, and so there's no money only goes so far, right? But so far, so far in the last three years, we've given away 600 free mammograms to women. And I have had some women come up to me and thank me and say, thank you, I got a free mammogram and uh, I got a bilateral, I got bilateral breast cancer and thanks to you, they found it, you know, on, in time. So, um, uh, that's what we do, and we educate. We had a, a big and very successful 5K October 1st at Ascaleta Park, and we're planning to have one on October 7th of this year. Um, and, you know, I think men and women and families and kids just wanted to get out there and be a part of something uh, uh, that we all share the same story of breast cancer. So um, I have, you know, some projects in, in mind. This is a full-time job, so I have a full-time job. And, and having a foundation is also a full-time job. And uh, so it's a challenge, but I want to continue working and, and, and making a difference in my community. You mentioned that baby that you had uh, after your tubal ligation, who must be in his- 19. <laughs> I was just gonna say about going on 20. <laughs> yeah. Because I remember that. And um, you know, your children have obviously been there uh, by your side throughout this journey. and. Um, 
you know, tell us about your relationship with them. My relationship with my children has always been good, and it's uh, it's even better now. Now that I, that they're adults, so I have a thirty. She'll be thirty four tomorrow. A thirty four year old, twenty eight year old, and nineteen year old, and um, it really helped. Well, you know, we like I said, we always had a good relationship, but but it really strengthened our relationship. And uh, they each wrote a chapter in the book. There's 44 chapters, and the, you know, the prologue and the epilogue, and there's a team Estela, and they each wrote um, a, uh, a chapter on how um, this cancer diagnosis and this journey changed them. And uh, my, daughter, my daughter's chapter is um, garlic, shrimp, and buttered biscuits. That's what my daughter uh, uh, wrote about on our trip to MD Anderson one day. For a second opinion, uh, she makes it look easy. Was one of the other chapters from my book from my son, and my youngest son uh, wrote about transformation and how it transformed him. Uh, he was 13 years old when I was diagnosed, so um, I think um, it's 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 an amazing relationship that I have with my kids. And I just came back from St. Louis. My my youngest son, he's on a volleyball and academic scholarship at Missouri Science and Technology. And it was a great trip because I see that he's thriving. And, you know, that's what you want to see your kids do is thrive and, 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 and be better, uh, be better people that they, you know, live um, and study and work with purpose. And, and, I see, and I see all three of them doing that. So I'm very proud of them. Um, I feel so blessed to have them uh, and to be such, such good citizens. You want, to be, you want them to be good people, and they are. And I don't want you, I'm not trying to get spoilers out of you uh, for your book, <laughs> but were there some things that you really had to think twice about sharing uh, in the book? And do you think there are some, some surprises for people when they read it? Well, I hope, I hope that a place to anchor, and a place to anchor means that you need to anchor in different things. It's not just, you know, I was a news anchor, uh, but I, I believe you really have to anchor in your faith, in your family, in your friends, and in your community to to get through a journey such as uh, bilateral breast cancer. Uh, no, there. I'm not going to tell you about any spoilers, but I, I don't judge me. <laughs> so there are some things here that that may surprise you that I went through, and uh, I hope it makes you smile. There's a there's a chapter on squirrels. There's a chapter on I floss every day. Uh, the red convertible, faith in motion, uh, have a pink day, las picosas. When I used to be in a in a cycling in a cycling uh, club, so um, I think I think I hope this book makes people smile, uh, makes people cry. They're gonna and think, and most importantly, think. So uh, I am I am almost done with my audio book, and I'm going to turn it in next week so it can be available on audio. And the young lady who's putting it together for for me here is. 23, 24 years old, and she she said, you know, I didn't think I would uh, identify with what you talked about because I thought it was all about cancer, right? She says I, she identified with some of the things that I wrote in there. So I think that it's not, this book is not just for uh, women or families or men on a cancer journey. It's on, it's for people on a life journey. I, I'm so glad you, you brought that up because that was, that was literally what I wanted to ask you next in terms of offering to young people, especially young Latinas, um, mm -hmm. maybe entering the world of journalism or writing, what advice would you offer them? Be real, be raw. So I, you know, I, this is an easy read. It's 296 pages, but it's an easy read because I've always lived by, keep it simple. <laughs> you know, keep it simple. And uh, I, I want you to think, but I don't want you to have to rewrite and reread it four times to understand it. So my, my writing is simple, it's clear, and it's concise. And what I want you to, what I want you to get out of this book is, uh, is that it was, you know, can, you can finish it in two days. You can finish it in two days. And uh, just to write and to, to, to be aware of the flow and to be aware of, of the words people use around you. You know, this is, this is not all about me. It's about, it's about my journey and all the people around me. And uh, it was my friends, my, my community, strangers. And uh, so just, just be real. You know, I'm, I'm the same person. You, it, what you see is what you get. 
And uh, I don't have a different persona. I don't have a different personality. And, and I think that's what you'll find in this book. I, uh, I hope you can you can hear me when you read when you read this and when you hear the audiobook on then you'll be able to hear. <laughs> <laughs> there will be no question. I did no question. <laughs> I, I did come across uh, a picture of you all together with uh, three of the gentlemen who in most recent years uh, you shared that anchor desk with. <laughs> so I, I want to finish by asking you so which was your favorite? Oh, they I love them all for different <laughs> reasons. You know, Gary um Gary, such a such a presence, and just I remember writing in his in his book that we got for him as he for his retirement. He, he was such a gentle man and a gentleman. You know, I just learned a lot from him. He in his quiet way, he taught me a lot about about journalism, about writing, about connecting. Uh, Rick Rick was a lot of fun. He he has this humanness about him and, and this humor about him that I learned from him too. And Eric, you know, Eric is 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 young and and fresh and from out of town, and he's he's embraced our community. So uh, all three of them, and I've had a lot of co-anchors. I had a lot of co-anchors over the years, and everybody, every single one of them brought something special to my life. Well, thank you, Estella, for bringing something so special into the lives of Borderland residents for almost four decades. And congratulations Oof. on the book. Thank you. Thank you. Casey, for thank you so much time. for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity. So happy to see you again. And that's our time for now. Join us this week on KRWG Radio every weekday. It's Morning Edition from 5 to 9, fresh air at 11, followed by here and now from noon to 2. And all things considered from 4 to 7. KRWG News is always online at krwg.org. And we'd like to hear from you. You can email us with story ideas and video submissions. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Casey Counts. Have a great week and we'll see you next time on Newsmakers.